Okay, we're about to start. If we could request um, folks to move a little bit closer. I know people have already started their lunch, but take a minute or so to grab things and move up a little closer to the front. That would be great. Um, so we can have more of a discussion and have it be a little more personal. So please do, if I can ask, move a little bit closer. Okay, and then um, we, can, we can start. So it's my privilege to introduce Susan Crawford, who's written this fantastic book here, which is available from your local independent bookstore. Um, I encourage you after, after hearing the talk and discussion to, to pick it up. And Susan will have some more remarks about, about ways that, that, that people can um, pick up copies of the, of the book along the way. But to quickly introduce Susan before turning it over to her um, for, for a lecture and then Q&A, um, Susan Crawford is the John A. Riley Clinical Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She previously was Obama's special assistant to the president for science, technology, and innovation policy, and co-led the FCC transition team between his and the Bush administrations. Earlier in her career, Crawford was a partner at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. As an academic, she teaches courses about climate adaptation and public leadership. Crawford is the author of several books, including Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry, and Monopoly Power in the New Gilded Age, and Fiber, The Coming Tech Revolution, and Why America Might Miss It. Her latest is Charleston, Race, Water, and the Coming Storm. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome uh, as we hear her talk about this book. Hey, I have a couple of copies of the book uh, for people who ask the best questions. So thank you so much for having me. Look, this conference is so important to me, and this is the first time I've ever attended. Uh, but if it wasn't for Ciders and Jesse Keenan and Carolyn Kuski and so many terrific people that I've met over the years and who've taught me about climate, I wouldn't be here. So thank you particularly to them, and thank you all for being here uh, to listen to me. Here's the cover of this book. Um, it's coming out in paperback in the UK. Apparently, the UK publisher is waiting for hurricane season so they can really um, scare everybody as the book comes out. So why did I do this? As you heard from my uh, resume, I come from a background of tech policy. I care a lot about infrastructure generally. And I uh, learned, as you all know, that we are uh, heading into a giant structural problem for the United States. These topics have been covered um, in all of our sessions together. We've got this holistic problem. It really seems bananas how badly suited our policies and structures are to the nature of the need and the transformational change that's going to be required over the next few decades, a matter of decades, not centuries, in this country and many others. Um, water levels were 100 feet higher the last time uh, carbon dioxide was this high. And strategic relocation is the way I like to talk about it. I know we have lots of different forms of words. Um, manage retreat does sound a little depressing sometimes. Uh, but I do think that the role of government in all of this is going to be central. So I learned from working on internet access in America that writing law review articles gets you nowhere. No one reads law review articles, they're not interesting. I wrote a few that got picked up in the popular press, but it was only when I wrote books about communities and people and what happens to people's lives in the absence of internet access, another crushing problem for America, uh, that I got any traction. So having learned that, and my last book in this area was called Fiber. It's all about cities across America building their own fiber optic networks um, to make sure that everybody, everybody with a belly button and internet access. Um, doing interviews for that book led me to Charleston. And I happened to uh, meet up with a local journalist named Jack Hitt, tremendous guy. And Jack said, ask Mayor Riley about the water. Joe Riley had been mayor of Charleston for 40 years and had presided over explosive growth and enormous change in the city. Very polite, uh, bespectacled, dapper guy in a khaki, khaki suit. And I asked him about the water. And all he would say is, it's going to be very expensive. 
And it seemed to me there was a quest, there was a story in Charleston that I needed to follow. So having picked up on the idea that narratives from communities can help change policy, which is what I'm up to uh, with this book project, I spent four years interviewing people in Charleston. I was very lucky to have a lot of access to Dutch engineers who came to town in 2019. And then I spent many, many days with members of the black communities in Charleston uh, who had a lot to say about what it's like to live there. Charleston is really a distillation of everything about America. Um, enormous growth, mostly over marshes, uh, over the last few centuries. Real focus on um, uh, real property and tourism. And the hidden pain of a tourist area is definitely present in Charleston. Seven million people visit every year. And uh, very few of them know that Charleston was the place where 40% of the enslaved people brought from West Africa forcibly first step foot. It's the place, of course, where um, secession was first adopted. You may not know this, but they were, the secessionists were meeting in Columbia, South Carolina, and then they decided that Charleston had better food and hotels. So they switched their operations to Charleston and then declared that they were free of the Union forever. Slavery was the basis of the economic growth of Charleston in its early years. Lots of uh, industries that were dependent on the exploitation of humans. Today, the prime industries are really real estate and tourism. Pleasure, essentially. And just as America is full of flamboyant and preposterous contradictions, there's this ahistorical sweet quality to Charleston that a tourist sees that lies just on top of an enormous amount of inequality, a complete absence of uh, public transit, um, uh, a real emphasis on growth and prosperity above everything, and a real cruelty um, in its history. So it's a great place to tell a story, but what's happening in Charleston is, of course, not isolated in Charleston. What I've picked up on in this city is happening around the world to different degrees and certainly in other coastal cities in America. Uh, so Charleston's a good way to, a good vessel for this story, but certainly not the only place. I'm encouraged at this point working on this narrative to think that we're at a a uh, very interesting point in our own development as a country at the end of an era of sort of neoliberal um, dismissing of government as a useful actor in our lives that we used to say, and in fact, when I uh, worked in the White House many, many years ago now, uh, the words industrial policy were sort of a swear word. Industrial policy was the way they would say it. You know, you don't do that. And, but industrial policy, the idea that government can actually provide the infrastructure for thriving lives, uh, that that's one of its functions is to keep people safe and ensure that they uh, live good lives is, is back on the table. Just this week, there was a terrific article on the front page of the New York Times by Patricia Cohen about um, the change over time in our attitudes towards the market being the place that should decide our destinies, that it, it certainly was as recently as 10 or 12 years ago, the idea that the market always leads and then only uh, governmental inter intervention is only ap appropriate if there's been a complete absence of effort by the market, but otherwise we really look to the private sector to solve our problems. That turns out not to be true, and I certainly have learned this in the technology policy context, and it's really true in the strategic relocation world. Um, so I think that we are at an interesting point. I'm very convinced that it's time to have a big legal reform movement, and I would like to be helpful to that, which is why I'm handing out copies of this book as much as possible. And if you're a grad student, I will just send you a PDF. You do not have to buy this book. Uh, because I want to make sure that you hear, listen to me and I get a chance to be in touch with you and that together we change the uh, legislation and the structures that are right now making it so difficult for all of us to work together to collaborate. So many heroes in this room doing their best against impossible odds and that needs to be fixed. So we're, I think we're at a time when this can happen. Personally for me, 
I've gotten very interested in um, the line between public sector action and private sector action. Just a few years ago, a student at Harvard looked at me and said, but the private sector can do everything better. Why do we need government? Why do we need government? And that was a serious question from the student's point of view, and it bugged me. So um, left to its own devices, I got to say, the market is solving adaptation in a sense. The crash in coastal real estate is coming that Carolyn and her colleagues have sketched out about $200 billion in coastal real estate overvalued um, because not having priced in the risk of sea level rise. Um, developers are planning ahead. They've got good data. They want to build new inland communities that are expensive luxury housing. Um, left to its own devices, the market will always do this find ways to serve the wealthiest among us while systematically leaving behind um, less well-off marginalized communities. And the federal government at the moment, in its most recent reports from the economic uh, part of the White House operation, has said we want the market to lead. Federal government isn't going to be uh, affirmatively on a very large scale rescuing people. Uh, Jesse Keenan does the best job of sketching out what the government is saying so far in its economic publications. I was very encouraged to hear from our federal heroes at this conference that they're doing their best, sort of behind the scenes, to knit together money and programs and a host of acronyms to make sure that uh, help gets to communities who need it, including most particularly capacity building but still not enough uh, support from the federal government. And it's really the Matthew effect in operation. Um, if you don't know about the Matthew effect, uh, it's the idea that the rich get richer. And it's certainly happening in the world of adaptation, absent um, additional government intervention. So that's why I wrote the book, I Care About the Public-Private Line. Charles, Char Charleston's an incredible vessel for this story. The people of Charleston have a lot to say, and I did my very best to center their voices, not my own, in telling the story. I was very uh, moved by Common Ground, the great 1980s book about um, Boston busing. And the way that story was told was through the family histories of four people all the way back to the great grandparents. And I did my level best to do the same here for Charleston. Um, oh, yeah. I don't want the world to be like this. Very gradual change we can believe in. I uh, was, <laughs> yeah. I was really delighted here in our plenary panel, uh, so much interest in transformational change, in uh, rethinking the way that we structure government intervention to ensure that there is a dedicated stream of money and dedicated people uh, ready to work on it. But right now, our, our legal structures are getting in the way. And in fact, all the arrows subsidize increased um, coastal real estate development and uh, not enough dramatic change. So let me introduce you to Charleston. If you haven't been there, if you're not one of the 7 million annual tourists who visits, uh, the little tiny peninsula there with the arrow coming in in from the right, that's probably where you visited if you were a tourist. It was um, launched as, as a settlement in 1670 by a group of uh, British, uh, probably third sons who came from Barbados um, with uh, enslaved people. There, the people investing in the colony begged them to move 30 miles inland. Like, don't, don't be there. Go where it's safe, because the ocean is right next to that peninsula. Um, you won't be protected. But they, they like the views, and so they set up shop. And Amitav Ghosh writes beautifully about this. The colonial attitude to nature uh, was that we can build. We're just going to build where the water is, even though it's, it's deranged to do so. It's not a great place to build New York City, not a great place to build Charleston. Over the last 30 years, Charleston has sprawled over the marshy area surrounding that peninsula. So West Ashley, Johns Island, James Island. Uh, the Canehoy Peninsula is uh, the tallest land, uh, highest above sea level, but the rest of it is pretty darn low. So that's Charleston now, almost 800,000 people in the metro area uh, and 7 million tourists. It's very, very low. A lot of people in Charleston live uh, 10 feet above sea level or less. 
It's more exposed than the Netherlands because there is a series of 40,000 tiny interconnected watersheds, essentially one vast low territory across which water can just sweep. So you're seeing here um, the barrier islands uh, lining the water right there, Kiowa, where a billion dollars of real estate changed hands last year, and then the slightly, slightly upland conditions uh, uh, above that. We're lucky to have uh, a 1934 map which overlaid the development of Charleston as it was then in the mid 20th century over the marshes and wetlands that the initial settlers found when they first got there. The place was riven by creeks, wet everywhere. 60% um, of modern day historical uh, peninsula Charleston is built on fill, on trash, on human remains, on dust, on dirt, on awful. Um, enslaved people really built Charleston uh, by creating new land. That's the way it happened. And as you know, that's not unusual. Same for New York City. Sandy, when it arrived more than 10 years ago, essentially rewrote the boundaries of Manhattan to what they had been when the original settlers arrived. And the same will happen uh, in Charleston. So much of it is built right over marsh. Um, I like to talk about water as not essentially uh, reaching new places, but remembering where it used to be before. So this is a picture of the famous battery of Charleston overcome by water in storms in 2017, where the Atlantic Ocean becomes indistinguishable from the land, such as it is, of the historic peninsula. It's a truly beautiful place. Uh, there are lots of people who love Charleston and the low country, but it's, it's low. Most of the land at 20 feet or lower is subject to storm surge. A lot of land has, there's sort of compound and cascading risks in Charleston. It's a concentration of risk. They've got everything. They've also got earthquakes um, and very, very high groundwater. Just go three feet down, 10 feet down, and you'll hit the water table and it's rising as the seas rise as well. So uh, they're gonna have pummeling rainstorms, you know, uh, hurricane risk, and high tides getting ever higher. So um, again, this is a map of where the floodplain is and how much is subject to storm surges, most of the metro area, and the population has exploded. 121,000 people were there in 1950, now uh, closer to 800,000. So that's a brief primer on Charleston. Right now, they are going through a very surprising, um, as the rest of the world will, uh, quantum of sea level rise. In their own planning for uh, the wall that the city is thinking about with the Army Corps of Engineers for, um, to surround that historic peninsula, they have chosen a value of 14 to 18 inches of rise by 2050, which is in accord with what NOAA says. But what's coming next is uh, probably three feet by 2070, according to NOAA, and probably five or six feet by the end of the century. And by choosing the six single value of 2050, I think uh, they and places like Galveston building the Ike Dyke are um, you know, putting themselves at great risk of many Katrinas across the course of this coming century. As the climate scientists keep telling us, things are moving very, very fast in an uncanny way. Um, the Gulf Stream has a big effect on Charleston, keeping about two to three feet of water away from the shore right now. And it's, it's slowing. It will slow even more. We've had alarming scientific news about that even over, over the last month or so. Um, many of you know all these facts, but the key element is that we cannot say with any certainty that there won't be eight feet or more of sea level rise by 2100. The problem for policymakers is what to do in the face of uncertainty. You all know this. Um, it seems to me, uh, thinking about the difference between the role of government and the role of the private sector, that it is in fact the role of government to plan for the worst case scenario right now. And we have very little time to do it. A matter again of decades, not centuries. And starting in about 2035, there's gonna be a hockey stick of accelerating sea level rise that will make it even more difficult to plan ahead uh, for strategic relocation. Okay, so 
Charleston sea level is rising and expected to continue to rise at rates higher than the global average, also true for much of the East Coast. Storms are accelerating. This is all background. Lots and lots of flooding. It flooded nearly 90 times in Charleston in 2019. All the top 10 years for flooding happened in the last 10 years. So rapid acceleration. So here's the historic peninsula. Um, as part of urban renewal, this Route 17 was drawn through the heart of a black uh, residential neighborhood on the Upper Peninsula to allow for people to uh, cross the region quickly. You can also, if you're coming from the airport, you may never see the northern part of this peninsula. You're sort of dumped by a freeway right in the historic part. On the uh, west side of the peninsula is a public housing area, uh, the Gadsden Green Homes, in a very low-lying place. This is true, as we know, for much of the public housing in, in America that it was built in low-lying, frequently flooded places, especially true on the Charleston Peninsula. And then on the east side, uh, there's a historically black area on the east side that is also very, very low and subject to flooding. Uh, the book uh, goes through the Charleston's history of uh, pretty much intentionally segregating uses of the peninsula as between black and white residents. And the east side was a part of an area in the 1930s designated by planners for the city uh, for black residents of Charleston, and it's really low. So again, the story is replicated across the country. It's not unique in Charleston. The book follows the stories of Reverend Joseph Darby, Quinnetha Frazier, Michelle Mapp, and, and Jacob Lindsay. Um, and you'll learn a lot about them. And they're wonderful, fascinating people uh, with uh, generations of, especially uh, Reverend Darby, uh, Ms. Frazier, and Ms. Mapp, generations of uh, ownership and uh, residence in Charleston. Uh, Queen Ether Frazier is of Gullah Geechee descent and has watched as you know, her people were displaced historically several times and now are being displaced by the water. Uh, Michelle Mapp um, is, uh, uh, God, it's hard, hard to describe her. She's a community leader who ran the community loan fund in South Carolina and then at the age of 50 went to law school so that she could fight back against statutes in Charleston that were uh, particularly pro-eviction and other policies. And she's, uh, she's watching the water rise. Reverend Darby is, gave me some of my best lines here. Uh, you can think of Charleston as a Confederate Disneyland. Confederate Disneyland, okay, how about that? It's a Confederate Disneyland and it's about to be SeaWorld. There you go, yeah. We, we need lines to get through this. So I, the book goes through the big TikTok here, lots of flooding, uh, lots of protests after George Floyd, not um, enough leadership vision across the area. Look, again, not unique to Charleston. Regional coordination is very difficult. I'm very happy to hear about that in our plenary panel. What can we do? Um, it's moving that Louisiana is doing things by watersheds. That's how the Netherlands does it. It needs to be accompanied by a ton of money. Uh, but watershed level planning would be great, but very difficult in Charleston and not happening. The current mayor, when I asked him about strategic relocation, said very firmly, not on my watch. The state does not permit cities to talk about relocation in your um, comprehensive plans. It's not on the table as an acceptable option. And there's a lot of sort of denial and boosterism. It's, uh, you know, it's a southern place, and this is true up and down the East Coast, but uh, Charleston feels that it is specially protected because of where it is on the coast, and uh, because it's the holy city, and it, it's a target for a lot of tourism. So they're saying, we're working on adaptation. They want to tell you, and they are, they are doing a lot. They, um, I want to credit them with getting rid of uh, building on fill. They've said you can no longer do that in Charleston. They have also, uh, they're planning for an integrated water plan so they'll understand where all of their watersheds are. And of course, they're planning on that wall with the Army Corps. But when it comes to transformative change, actually thinking ahead to where and how low-income and historically marginalized communities can be assisted in a holistic way to go through the grieving process of leaving this beautiful place, their culture, their memories, and as communities, um, relocated in a supportive way and safer, higher, drier places. None of that is happening in Charleston, as we've discussed, not happening in, in any American city, really. 
Um, and in fact, they're doubling down on development. Uh, they're right now discussing what's called the Union Pier plan um, to redevelop an area. You can barely see it in that white square. They're going to be building 1,600 condos, 600 hotel rooms, half a million suite of, of uh, commercial space in an area that on this 18th century map was in the Cooper River. And that's happening right now. They've they just delayed the planning for this big development um, a year, but it, it's going to go forward. And uh, they need the tax revenue. That's the fact. That's what Liz told us on the last panel. Um, and they don't want to spook the tourists either. So what are we up to here? We, I think there is a real institutional vacuum. I heard the concern um, that we shouldn't create a new agency, but the idea that there are 30 plus federal agencies spraying money at reacting to disasters and nobody's clearly in charge um, of making sure that we have a plan and, and that these good people across agencies are doing their level best to coordinate as a matter of kind of guerrilla warfare seems to me to be short-sighted. Uh, so I would, uh, I want to, you know, we have limited time on earth and it seems to me that I can be helpful in continuing to sketch out this problem and helping to mobilize forces that redraft legislation and send things in a better direction. Because the sooner we all decide to face the risk, put all the risk on the table and say to ourselves, would you get on an elevator if it had a nine out of 10 chance of getting to the bottom safely? Probably not, right? We don't want to put our people in harm's way, even if we're not completely certain that they'll be chronically inundated by 2070. The fact that there's a substantial risk that that's the case should drive us to action now, not 10 years from now. Um, and right now, as we've discussed in this conference, all we're doing is making things more difficult for people to move. More impediments, uh, more sense of a lack of community in engagement, more um, lack of coordination between agencies and also the spray of acronyms that everybody has to know in order to navigate this space seems just bonkers. I keep saying bonkers and bananas because I can't come up with any better words for this and I don't like to swear, so I'm, I'm sort of stuck with this. Um, we need to scale what climate migration is up to and what the NRDC is doing so that nobody feels lonely working on this issue and give them additional resources. We need to give the federal agencies much more money to be working on this. Because I'm a creature of the executive branch in a sense and federal uh, power, it seems to me that getting the federal government better aligned here is a necessary condition of moving forward as a country. Um, because without the federal government, we can't clean up our air, we can't clean up our water. We can do a lot of planning at the local level but you need the resources and leadership of the federal government to really get it done. Um, so we need new laws, new institutions. I was a touch to hear that Bangladesh is planning with its internal cities to be, have them be receiving cities. They're even, they're thinking about this because their coastline is fraying so quickly. Why, why can't we do that in the United States? Plan with receiving cities to take in people and be ready with the housing and everything else they'll need. Oh yeah. Sometimes when I help, try to help people visualize this problem, I say, imagine there is a charging rhino right outside the doors of this conference room. We don't know when exactly he's gonna get here. We know it's gonna be abrupt. It's gonna be disruptive. It's gonna be scary. Why can't we plan ahead to be you know, ready for the charging rhino, which is the, for me, coastal sea level rise seems like a, a gigantic problem. And I'm encouraged, okay, my last visual before we open it up to, uh, questions is this one. Does anybody recognize this? You know what this is? Oh good, let me tell you the story. So the Dust Bowl was in large part created by the federal government, encouraging people to move to the heartland and dig up the soil to you know create farms. That created enormous dust storms and a huge problem for millions and millions of people. Well, uh, after 20 years of agitating for more money for soil conservation methods and, and assistance, uh, a, a federal official was testifying in Congress on March 10th, 1935, about the need for additional money and help from Congress. And that moment, the Dust Bowl arrived in Washington and turned the skies black. 
And the testifying official said, look, there goes Kansas. Anybody know this story? I think that's tremendous. And so visual evidence of what's happening, as we saw with the, um, uh, you know, the, the fires, the wildfires from Canada that turned the skies orange, that happened in DC, happened in New York. We are getting to the point where the, we, everybody has to see what's happening. We're heading into another gigantic hurricane season this year. And Congress, when it saw that dust storm in 1935, acted. Did. It structurally changed our approach to the Dutch Bowl, poured money into federal agencies to alleviate the tremendous soil erosion problems, and helped communities lead thriving lives. So that's the book. I've got two copies free for the first two great questions. Ah, come on, play with me here. And uh, also, if you're a grad student, just send me your email address. I'd be happy to help. And I'm at S. Crawford on Twitter, and you can find me easily on the Harvard website. So thank you all very much for listening. Any questions? Any Charlestonians? No? It, uh, what is the protocol for questions? Do we have a traveling mic? Oh, it's back here. I'm sorry. You're going to have to walk. If, because I know there are people listening to the um, live stream who can't be here. I'm so sorry. Oh, good. Yes. Hi. Please tell us who you are and what we can do for you. Hi. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Elise Savar. I'm from the University of North Texas. I'm curious. The mayor is very set on not managed retreat. And the fact that Charleston has had buyouts, I'm wondering how he reconciles that history with that future. Um, people are capable of enormous self-deception. So, and I, I've certainly seen this in other policy worlds, that if it is in your financial interest to not scare people by talking about manage retreat and you see buyouts as individual, isolated occurrences, um, you, don't, you don't feel any cognitive dissonance between, like that union peer development, the fact that that's happening at the same time that properties are being bought out in damp areas of Charleston should be alarming, but it's not. So it's that sort of denial, boosterism, and firmness about the holy city staying where it is. Now, it may be because of its historical significance or something that uh, we end up armoring or attempting to armor Charleston, but the only country I've seen that's really talking about this is the Netherlands. They, they're great at armoring, but they're now saying if sea level rise gets to, you know, two meters or more by the end of the century, that armoring isn't going to hold. And so they have to start, some segments of the government are saying we need to start considering managed retreat. They can at least put it on the table. A place like Charleston can't do it. But great question. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, Judy East, uh, Resource Information, Land Use Planning, State of Maine. Um, I was just in Charleston a month ago, and I was appalled that getting out of the taxi, the smell of sewage, and I asked about it, and yeah. apparently every time it rains, that's what happens. Yep. So that's just an observation. Question about the design of that condo unit. Yeah. Is it going to have, like, parking on the floor with ability for the storm surge to go through underneath? Are, they think, are the developers thinking about the design they in that respect? They definitely are. Yeah, de the developers have water at the top of their mind. They do, and they're going to set the whole thing up at least 16 feet preliminarily. Um, so you'd assume that the cars would be above the water. But here's the thing. All the roads are threatened as you try to move around this area. And uh, this visual sometimes gets people, what if you're in a car that has started driving to try to evacuate from some terrible flood event, and then you're, you get into a big pool of water, you can't roll down your windows. You know, you're just sort of stuck there. So what happens to you? Um, so people talk about, they'll say, well, my house is on high land, but if the roads around you are not, that's just as bad as if your own house was flooded too. So um, the whole region is really, really low. And when the Dutch engineers came to visit, they were, they were alarmed at what they saw. Back to the, the sewage in the water, cholera spores have been detected in the water that 
uh, shows up when it rains. Um, there's a lot of junk and trash right under the streets. And we all know this, when, when there's floods, that water is fetid and unsafe. So it's amazing that you smelled it, but that, that's reality. Yeah, yeah, yes. Hello, um, my name is Sarah LaPuma. I work for FEMA Region 2 in Mitigation, yeah. and I'm excited to read your book. Oh, so good. thank you so much. Um, my question was, um, for the residents that you interviewed, did they talk about the, the difficult um, question of having you know, been basically pushed into these low-lying areas because of redlining and, and uh, racist mm -hmm. housing policies, and then the government coming back and saying, we'll help you get out, get out and be relocated out of mm -hmm. the situation that they were, they had been put in mm -hmm. already, partially by the government. <sighs> I don't know if anybody had exactly this, that sweep of history, except um, the Gullah Geechee people who uh, feel betrayed many times over by government. And, uh, you know, they were their uh, former slaves who stayed in Reconstruction and were promised 40 acres and a mule. And then that promise was ripped away from them and their land was taken back by plantation owners. Now, nonetheless, many really hung on uh, in huge settlements along the Georgia and South Carolina coast. And now uh, developers are coming to, um, you know, build on their land and water's coming. So there's a lot of distrust of government. Um, and one interviewee, I want to repeat this remark so you hear it. She said to me, I'm not going anywhere unless you tell me that the white people on Hilton Head and Kiowa are also having to leave. The question of who has to leave and then what happens to the land after they've left, does it get developed and flipped and made available to yet another family um, who then gets in trouble with rising waters is deeply felt. So who has to leave, where are they gonna go and what happens to the land are big questions for these interviewees as they are across the world, yes. Yeah, your last comments uh, touched on my, my question a bit, but one thing that I didn't really understand until we first convened this conference, like four, four years ago, was, was to really sort of feel this paradox of, on the one hand, the need for upscaling, mm -hmm. federal, federal action, shared learning, but then also what, what I really heard for the first time from the communities then mm -hmm. was each of us, each community has a right individually to decide sort of on our time scale in our mm -hmm. decision context. So that's obviously a difficult paradox. I was, I was curious sort of in your interactions, maybe with some of those community members you mentioned, is there any sort of way out of that paradox? Is there, is there any sort of potential for community driven upscaling, I guess, and, and, and sort of more, more rapid action? It's a terrific question. And it's one I've really felt uh, viscerally at this conference. It's a both and answer for them and for me that you need vast amounts of federal money and some basic institutional parameters and then a lot of delegation and support for communities that want to make their own decisions. But there also has to be, I think, at the federal level, leadership saying that at a trigger point, and we just heard this from the Netherlands in, a, in an earlier con conference session, at a trigger point where it becomes too risky to maintain property, we're going to decommission public infrastructure that's there. Roads, sewage, water. And without that end point being set, someone has to set that end point. Um, you get a lot of uh, populations living without uh, the support of a civilized society where they are. And that, uh, from my perspective, sh I, th I think should be unthinkable, that we don't leave people without public infrastructure to support them. But as long as we can keep the decision voluntary to leave, let's do that. But who said it in an earlier panel, if you wait long enough, that voluntary decision becomes mandatory. So it's, it's a temporal uh, distinction. Right, maybe right now, communities can make their own decisions at some point that becomes impossible. And I'm really excited about the prospect of land trusts and other vehicles that people could use to get the present value of their property if they own it, 
not have to pay property taxes. We'll have to fix that somehow. And then, but it, their ownership does not extend beyond their own life. And then the land is decommissioned, is returned back to nature, and it's the land trust that does that. So we, there are lots of things we have to invent that will help us bridge these gaps. But the complexity of the problem requires sort of a fractal approach, both every community and great government involvement at the federal level, I think. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Jamin Vandenhoek. I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University. Yeah. Um, this anecdote's really stayed with me, or this graphic. I was uh, taught about this story as a junior in college. Yeah. And I didn't actually know if it was apocryphal or real, so thanks real. for confirming. I'd never yeah. seen the picture. Um, but this is, I guess, part of my question is, certainly the Congress people who responded with action, part of that was, you know, the, the, the use of empirical visual data right in front of you. But this image suggests the powerful symbolic impact of the Dust Bowl as well, shrouding the Lincoln uh, Memorial, Lincoln Monument. So I'm curious, um, data and observations can be used both ways. I'm reminded of James Inhofe on the Senate floor holding up a snowball, oh. saying how is climate change real when we've got snow like this? <laughs> um, so that's personal observation too, right? But it seems with a place like Charleston, it may be central to your book, which sounds really interesting, the connections of place and history, and you talked about multi-generational ownership, that's really powerful, that the tethering. So mm -hmm. what do you think about the importance of symbolic loss, right? Like, the, I'm thinking of, let's just say, like um, landmarks that are so important locally that are swept away. Like, how will that, how will that, what steps would you think would be necessary for the mayor to say this isn't even Charleston anymore? It's changed so much. This isn't the place we know because these key facets that keep us tethered to Charleston and make it such a wonderful place to live and, and call home for generations are no longer here. Thanks. Yeah, as I take into that question, I, I feel grief. I think a lot of communities feel a lot of grief to lose their culture, lose their identifying markers, and also no marker captures what they love about that place, really. It's much more about the human connections they had there. And here's the fact, our lives pass in a blink of an eye. There's an abyss before us and an abyss after. We're just here for an instant. And so as more generations passed, pass, that will eventually, uh, people will let go those attachments. Um, but it is, it's, it, sometimes I talk about the need for hospice-like wraparound services, but I wanna make it more positive. Like, you're not gonna, you will die, your community will be changed irrevocably, but there is a future, there is a place where you can be, where you'll have a thriving life. And we don't have the idea of an afterlife for hospice, but something like that with wraparound services to which everybody is entitled, if you're alive, you get a whole raft of social you know, workers and nurses and all these people who arrive to help you through the transition to death. Well, why can't we do something like that here? But your question has many levels, and uh, I think we have not yet begun to explore uh, the nature of the grieving process for these places. Hi, my name is Darlene Finch. I work for NOAA, and I did live in Charleston, so mm. I recognize all those maps. Yeah. Um, my question is really more about trigger points. I'm yeah. really intrigued by that. And I'm really, as a Fed, I think we send a lot of maybe different incentives out there that suggest that we may have solutions to some of these problems, and we never say, but the solution is only going to take you so far. Mm -hmm. At some point, the wall is going to fail, the adaptation yeah. option isn't going to, and we don't, we don't seem to be able to get <laughs> over that, that yeah. wall to the conversation. At some point, you can't live here anymore. So I love the idea of trigger points, yeah. but, I, but I'd, I'd love other thoughts you might have on that, because I, I think it behooves a lot of us to figure out this will only take you so far. You need to understand that, which right. isn't happening in the conversation. So. Well, talk to Carolyn Knaus. What's your last name? Are you here? No, she's not here. She was speaking about the Netherlands planning and that uh, they have said, you know, these giant barriers they built to protect the Ronstadt, the conurbation of a huge population on the coast of the Netherlands, 
they were built to be opened once every 10 years, maybe checked every year, but only, only closed once every 10 years. And if there comes a point where they have to be closed more often or they're systematically overtopped, that's a trigger point. So, you know, there are, uh, we should be able to think of metrics that will say to ourselves this far and no farther. Uh, we have this magical belief that we can build around this and we could, but at cosmic ridiculous expense that uh, would actually make life behind those walls pretty miserable for the swamps that are created there and the, the visual of the whole thing, would be, it would be awful and hugely expensive. So um, I'm with you on the need to develop uh, a whole suite of trigger points. And I think for decommissioning public infrastructure, you know, when does Amtrak give up? Um, that seems really important to, to figure that out. Yeah, yes. We have two online questions. The Good. first one is, if you could do the Charleston book treatment for any other city in the world, what would you choose and why? Please exclude Miami. <laughs> well, one reason I chose Charleston is that it wasn't Miami. Everybody always talks about Miami. No one ever talks about Charleston in this context. And it seemed to me such a rich historical city uh, and so weird, really, that it was worth spending time on it. What would I choose? Well, I'm really interested right now in London. What, you know, um, they are threatened by ocean waters. They also have tried to build barriers. Um, so much economic, you know, the center of England, how are they thinking about it? So, but it's, it's the great thing about Charleston is that it's, in my mind at least, the right size to grapple with as an author and maybe London's too big. So, but that's a great question. Somebody recently told me that 90% of Vietnam will be covered chronically by water by 2050, um, or flooded at least once a year. That was what it was, flooded at least once a year. And that's the third largest rice producing nation in the world. So um, maybe I should go to the Southeast and maybe um, I would go to Vietnam and find out what, what's happening there. So those are my two answers. I don't know why I'm standing up here. You guys are the experts, but I'll just stand here until you tell me to go away. Go ahead. The last online question yeah. is, if you could do the Charleston book treatment for, excuse me, we already read that one, yeah. sorry. Um, what, do you think, what do you think a national adaptation strategy needs in order to effectively help communities like Charleston? Right, well, this sounds too uh, militaristic, but we should be, treating this as if we were on a war footing, uh, really organizing all of government to think ahead to um, how we're going to assist the millions of people who are gonna make this transition and not doing it simply through incentives to the private sector, as we are with the mitigation side of the equation. So I would like to see a national adaptation plan that treats this as a central pillar of United States policy for our survival into the future and that includes uh, planning not only for money, and we can afford to pay for what we care about, but also for um, you know, real leadership and collaboration and um, prioritization. And I would uh, have a, uh, you know, I would treat this as the opportunity we treat green energy. We say there are all these new businesses, all these new jobs, coming from the transition to a non-fossil fuel economy. And we can make lots of calculations about that. Nobody has done that for this, that there are new cities to be built, um, new, new, ways, new ways of making a living that will come out of this, new ways of thinking about ourselves as a country. We, we really should treat this as the same kind of priority that emissions have been, but have much more government um, prioritization. I, I would also uh, ensure that there are regional authorities um, uh, based on the existing ones to the, you know, the maximum possible to force and allow cities to collaborate with each other without worrying about property tax <laughs> and to somehow uh, subsidize and mandate that effort because right now in the Charleston region there are a dozen cities and they can't cooperate with each other and it's clear that they should be taking some of the um, sales tax that comes from the historic peninsula and trading that with people inland in exchange for land rights. I mean, there are all kinds of things that should be happening. And the, our federal government should be driving that kind of regional 
um, adaptation, forward thinking. Look, there's a lot that needs to go into this, and you've, uh, FEMA is thinking about a national adaptation framework. I think the most important element is the seriousness with which the federal government is going to take this challenge and leadership. Thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you. um, this question takes a bit more of like an ethereal slant, yeah. but I'm just very curious through the stories that you heard and the story that you're telling, um, what did you hear from folks about a compelling future for them, whether mm -hmm. it's in Charleston or somewhere else? Um, because I think so often we talk about, when you're talking about walls, my mind went to like parable of the sower walled communities. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to think about what is compelling about this future based on the stories and perspectives and histories and desires that folks have that live there now that you interacted with. Thank you so much for that question. I think the idea of um, community and culture, which many people talk about at this conference, is central to this future. That even if I, this body, am, not, am no longer attached to this particular parcel of land, I am with people who care about me and I care about them. And that to the extent possible, our culture stays alive, whatever that means. Um, human beings are actually pretty adaptable and resilient when we're forced to be, and we don't want to force this relocation, but if we can give a sense of hope in community and culture, that's what they're looking for. To be really simple about it, that's what it is. Um, and wouldn't need to involve particular uh, buildings or monuments. It is the, the people that they care about in the sense that their grandchildren, their grandchildren's grandchildren will have a place to call home that's safe. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. Good. <clears throat> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Anna Morandi with the Pew Trusts. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so one, there is, if people are interested, there is a bill that will probably be dropped this year to um, propose a national adaptation strategy and a chief resilience officer in the White House. Good. Um, it was dropped last year to mixed success, mixed reviews. Um, and it's probably going to get rewritten again this year, uh, taking climate out um, and really uh, cutting it back a lot and making it pretty short and very palatable for, um, let's just say, both sides <laughs> of the aisle. Um, so that's one thing. I don't know if folks are mm -hmm. interested in that. Um, the what do you second, mean by taking climate out? How do you take climate oh, out? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, you take climate out of the language. Oh, the language, yeah. 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 Yeah, my very first interview with the current mayor, he said, do you want to talk about climate change or sea level rise? Yeah. And I said, oh, sea level rise, yeah. Yeah, no, it's still, it's still a thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's still a thing. Um, so the other thing I was just curious about, because from our perspective, we've been working with South Carolina um, for a while on, on their building their resilience office and providing um, technical support for them. And they're actually really pro buyout. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm confused a little bit with the, the statement that you said about the, um, the towns that aren't, aren't able to include um, retreat and buyouts and that kind of language in their plans because it's all over the state plan and there's 35 million dollars available for communities um, for buyouts so I'm just kind of want to know more about that like there's a footnote in the book it, it, it's it's the word well let me get you the site I don't want to speak off the cuff but the idea of retreat like whole scale retreat picking up up town and moving somewhere else is not part of the comprehensive planning so yes, individual buyouts, but they're very individual. They're not, they're not wide scale. Yeah, I mean, Carolina. it's a start. I think yeah. it is really unpalatable to say, how does the entire town of Charleston get up and move? Yeah. But I think, you know, it, it just that sort of, okay, low lying, okay, the next, the next, like that yeah. just seems to be the way our brains can process this right. and our processes can handle it. That's right. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to. I appreciate that. It yeah. is uncanny. And there's this another weird thing that happens where sometimes in visuals you'll see marsh re-migrating. People will talk joyfully about the marsh. And no one seems to mention that the, the place where the marsh is re-migrating in those drawings is the east side you know, is these traditional low-lying places. Mm -hmm. So then what happened to the people? Where'd they go? 
So yeah, all uh, complex and fascinating subject. Yeah, thanks very much for your presentation. Love to meet you afterwards. So that's it. It has been a joy to be with you and a privilege. And again, I'd be happy to share the book with any grad students. And I look forward to the um, you know, acceleration of the movement that's needed to counterbalance the acceleration in risk to our uh, fellow residents' lives. Thanks so much.